In the gradual transformation of the old world of classical antiquity into the world with which the statesmen of today must deal, no man played a greater part than Charles the Great, King of the Franks and Emperor of Rome. The sharp lines of demarcation which we often draw between a period and period, and which are useful as to help's memory, have not, for the most part, had any real existence in history. For in the world of men, as in the development of the material universe, it is true that uniformity rather than cataclysm is the rule. Natura non vidit per saltum. Still, there are some great landmarks, such as the foundation of Constantinople, Alaric's capture of Rome, the Hijira of Mohammed, the discovery of America, the Reformation, and the French Revolution, which have no merely artificial existence. We can see that the thoughts of the great majority of civilized men were suddenly forced into a different channel by such events, that after they had occurred, men hoped for other benefits and feared other dangers than they had looked before these events took place. And such a changeful moment in the history of the world was undoubtedly the life of the great ruler who is generally spoken of as Charlemagne, and preeminently, the year 800 when he was crowned as emperor at Rome. So join me, you over 21,000 francs, and the 90% who hadn't subscribed yet. History was forever changed when Charles first appeared upon the scene. The Roman Empire, at least as far as Western Europe was concerned, had been for more than three centuries slowly dying. An event to which allusion has just been made, the capture of Rome by Alaric in 410, had dealt the great world empire a mortal blow. And yet, so tough was its constitution, so deeply was the thought engraven even on the hearts of its most barbarous enemies, Rome is the rightful mistress of the world, that it seemed as if that world empire could not die. The Visigoth, the Ostrogoth, the Vandal, the Burgundian, the Lombard, coming forth from the immemorial solitude of their forests, streamed over the cities and the vineyards of the Mediterranean lands, and erected therein their rude state systems, their barbaric sovereignties, but even in framing their uncouth national codes, they were forced to use the language of Rome. In government, they could not dispense with the official machinery of the empire. In religious affairs, above all, they found themselves always face to face with men to whom the city by the Tiber was still, Roma Caput Mundi. Hence, in all new barbarian kingdoms that arose on the ruins of the empire, there was a certain feeling of precariousness and unrest, a secret fear that the power which had come into being so strangely and so unexpectedly would in a moment vanish away, and that the Roman Augustus would assert himself once more as supreme over the nations. To borrow a phrase from the controversies of a much later date, the Visigothic and the Burgundian and the Lombard kings were obviously kings de facto, but there was a latent consciousness in the minds of their subjects, perhaps in their own also, that they were not kings de jour. Had the Italian peninsula been less easily accessible by way of the Julian Alps, or had Rome been situated in a stronger position as Constantinople, it is possible that this secret belief in her rightful predominance might have won back a Roman emperor, that dominion over Europe which had in fact wielded for a time by the Roman popes. But the virtual transference of the seat of the empire from the Tiber to the Bosphorus, which was the result of the foundation of the new Rome, and the frequent successful sieges of the old Rome, prevented the Roman emperor from thus reasserting himself. There were jealousies between Rome and Constantinople already before the end of the 4th century. And when, under Justinian, the empire made its wondrous effort to recover the ground which it had lost in Africa, in Italy, and in Spain, though these reconquests were effected in the name of a Roman Augustus, it was felt, and often loudly asserted, that the armies which fought under the imperial standards were Greek rather than Roman. Thus, through all the kingdoms of the West, even while the emperor enthroned at Constantinople was looked upon as in some sense the legitimate monarch of the world, the old, deep-rooted hostility between East and West also made itself felt, and it was becoming every day more improbable that the Western lands should ever be brought under the rule of a Byzantine Caesar. Ere the long, slow agony which I have called the death of Rome was completed, the world was startled by the outbreak of the fierce Semitic monotheism which is associated with the name of Muhammad. In 622, rather more than two centuries after Alaric's capture of Rome, Muhammad escaped from Mecca to Medina, and in this retreat of his followers of his faith in succeeding ages have rightfully seen the beginning of his career of spiritual conquest. Wherefore, they date all their events from the midnight journey of a fugitive, even as the other great oriental faith has taken for its landmark the birth of a little child in a stable. Before Muhammad's death in 632, the career of the Saracen conquest had begun. Near the close of the 7th century, Syria, Persia, Egypt, North Africa were torn from the empire of the Caesars and obeyed the rule of the Caliph. In 711, Europe saw the first breach made in its defenses when the great Iberian Peninsula, 
all save a few mountain glens in the remote north, was conquered by the Moors, and Mecca took the place of Jerusalem or Rome as a spiritual center of gravity for Spain. The turbaned invaders crossed the Pyrenees. In 725, they penetrated as far as Autun, only 150 miles from Paris. Though defeated by Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne, in the great Battle of Poitiers, the Moors remained encamped on the soil which we now call France. Narbonne was in their possession at the time of the birth of Charlemagne, and remained so during the years of his boyhood, till won back for Christendom by his father in 759. In the east of Europe, the Avars still hung menacingly over the Italian and Illyrian lands. A people allied to the Huns, they occupied the mid-Danubian region, which had been the seat of the barbarian empire of Attila, and though their power had declined somewhat from that which they wielded in the 7th century, it was still a serious danger to civilization. As we shall see, however, the barbarous and heathen Saxons in the lands between the Lower Rhine and Elbe, representing the Teutonic spirit in its fiercest and most stubborn moods, represented an even more formidable obstacle to that remodeling of Europe in the likeness of the old Roman Empire, which was the aim of the great statesman with whose life we have to deal. Such, very briefly, was the aspect of affairs when Charles the Great, the descendant of many mayors of the palace, and of one king, found himself, with the power of the Frankish nation collected on his sole right hand, controller of the destinies of Western Europe. Without going too far into the times preceding his ascension, something in order to explain his position must be said, both as to the Frankish nation and to the Arnulfing family. In the northeast part of Gaul dwelt, in the latter part of the 5th century after Christ, a confederacy of German tribes called the Salian Franks, occupying the districts known in later days as Flanders, Artois, and Picardy. Farther south was the strong and warlike tribe of Ripuarian Franks, whose territory stretched along the banks of the Rhine from Mainz to Cologne, and along the Moselle from Koblenz to Metz. Salians and Ripuarians recognized a loose tie of kinship between them, but there was no strong feeling of unity even in the subdivision of the two nations. Both Salian and Ripuarians had many petty kings, and there were frequent civil wars between them. In this state of things, one of those petty kings, Clovis, the Salian Frank, began to reign at Tournai in 481, being then 15 years of age. When he died in the years 511, after 45 years of life and 30 of sovereignty, he had made himself sole master of all Frankish men, and subdued to his dominion three-fourths of France and a great block of territory in southwestern Germany. Let us briefly recapitulate these conquests, omitting the wars in which the other Frankish princes, whether Salian or Ripuarian, went down before him. In 486, he overthrew the Roman governor Sigarius, who had set up some sort of independent kingship at Soissons. This conquest gave Clovis the provinces afterwards known as Champagne and Lorraine. In 496, he defeated the Alemanni in a great battle, the ultimate result of which was the annexation of the wide district on the right bank of the Rhine, known in the Middle Ages as Swabia comprising in terms of a modern geography, Alsace, Baden, Württemberg, the western part of Bavaria, and the northern part of Switzerland. The well-timed conversion to Christianity and to the Catholic form of Christianity, which followed this victory, facilitated the next great conquest of Clovis. In the year 507, he went forth to war against Alaric, the king of the Visigoths, defeated and slew him, and thus added Aquitaine, that large and fertile region which lies between the Loire and the Pyrenees, to his dominions. Four years after this he died, but in the next generation, between 524 and 534, his sons conquered Burgundy, and thus added to their father's kingdom the whole valley of the Rhone from its source to its mouth, except the narrow but rich land of Provence, which was retained by the Ostrogoth kings of Italy for a few years longer. But in 536 this also became Frankish. Contemporaneously with the conquest of Burgundy preceded the conquest of Thuringia, the fair region in the heart of Germany which still bears that name and the establishment of the overlordship of the Franks over the nation of the Bavarians, whose country stretched from the Danube across the Alps into the valley of the Adige and up to the very gates of Italy. The date of this last addition to the Frankish dominions cannot be precisely ascertained, but it may be stated approximately at the year 535. It will be seen from this brief summary how rapidly the tide of the Frankish conquest rose, almost to the same high-water mark which it maintained at the time of the birth of Charlemagne. In 50 years from the first appearance of Clovis as a warrior, the Franks have subdued the whole of modern France, except the little strip of Languedoc, the Low Countries, Switzerland, and all of Germany as far as the Elbe, and the mountains of Bohemia, except Hanover and a part of Westphalia, which is occupied by the untamed and still heathen Saxons. 
Such a monarchy, even now, would be the greatest power in Europe. In the 6th century, with Spain weakened by the estrangement between Arians and Catholics, with Italy torn by strife between the empire and its barbarian occupants, with Britain still in other chaos, nibbled at but not devoured by her Anglo-Saxon invaders, the Kingdom of the Franks, when united and at peace within itself, was the strongest power in Europe. With the two doubtful exceptions at the Kingdom of the Savage Avars and the tottering fabric of the Roman Empire. But the years in which the Frankish Kingdom was thus united and at peace with itself were few. It had been built up by the ferocious energy of one man and his sons. It was hardly, in any true sense of the word, national. And he and his descendants treated it rather as an estate than a country, partitioned and repartitioned it in a way which wasted its strength and ruined its chances of attaining to political unity. The comparison may seem a strange one, but in the personal, non-national character of his policy, the first Frankish king reminds one of the latest French conqueror. The career of Clovis may be illustrated by that of Napoleon. Both men empathetically fought for their own bands. Both were more intent on massing great countries under their sways than in really assimilating the possessions which they had already acquired. Both, in different ways, made or tried to make the Catholic Church an instrument of their ambition. And both seemed to have looked upon Europe, or so much of it as they could acquire, as a big state to be divided among their children or relations. There is no need here to dwell upon the perplexing details of the division of the kingdom of Clovis among his sons and grandsons. We perceive a tendency to regard the northeastern portion of the realm, especially that conquered from Sagarius, as the true kernel of the kingdom, and therefore, widely as the dominions of the brothers stretch asunder, their capitals, Metz, Orléans, Soissons, and Paris, all lie comparatively near to one another, all probably within the ring fronts of the Sagarian kingdom. But there is also a tendency to fall asunder into four great divisions. Burgundy and Aquitaine, though they did not formally resume their independence, are often seen as separate kingdoms under a Frankish king. But the more important division, the more fateful rivalry separates the two northern kingdoms, which eventually received the names of Neustria and Austrasia. In Neustria, which contained the regions of Flanders, Normandy, Champagne, and central France as far as the Loire, there was doubtless a very large Gallo-Roman population. Though its numbers may not have so enormously preponderated over those of the Teutonic immigrants as in Aquitaine and Burgundy. The Roman language and some remains of Roman culture survived here in Neustria, and were preparing the ground for the formation of the medieval kingdom of France. Austrasia, on the other hand, the territory of the Rhine and the Moselle seems to have remained essentially German. The Latin speech in this country must have been confined to ecclesiastics and a few of the more cultured courtiers. It can never have been the speech of the people. And though here we must speak rather by conjecture than by proof, it is probable that the old Germanic institution and the Hundred and the Gau survived here in greater vigor than on the alien soil of the Romanized Gaul. It was also through the rulers of Austrasia that the connection, frail and precarious as it often might be, was kept between the Frankish monarchy and the great semi-independent duchies of the Thuringians, the Alemanni, and the Bavarians. Thus, already in the fissure between the western and eastern portions of the Merovingian kingdom, we see the rift, premonitory of the mighty chasm which now separates the great states of France and Germany. This is the first of an 18-part series on Charlemagne and the Franks. If you want the maps, sources, songs, and more, support me on Patreon or become a channel member. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.